As we get older, we get wiser. Or, at least, that's what we've always been taught to believe. If that old saying is true of people, it also ought to be true of communities and civilizations. We're not sure that's the case, though. In fact, we think it's increasingly likely that our ancient ancestors knew a thing or two about technology that we no longer know today. Watch this video and you might well find yourself agreeing with us. We're starting off with a very big question. Did the ancient Peruvians have a method for softening stone? We ask because of the evidence at the ancient site of Sacsayhuaman that strongly suggests they did. This walled complex is famous for its huge dry stone walls, somehow carefully cut with such precision that they fit together perfectly without mortar. Some of the individual stones weigh as much as 150 tons. They're the largest used in any construction project in pre-Hispanic America and display a quality of craftsmanship that's unmatched anywhere on the continent. Even today, more than 500 years after Sasuke Waman was built, it's impossible to fit a single sheet of paper into the gaps between the stones. The corners of the blocks appear to have been artificially rounded and the walls lean inward in a variety of interlocking patterns. No tools have been found in the vicinity of Sasuke Wayman, and the nature of the method used to build the walls remains unknown. It ought to have been impossible for the people of the time. They might even be older than 500 years. Garcilaso de la Vega, who was born in the area in 1539 and wrote a brief history of the region, says that the walls were already ancient by the time he was born. As impressive as Sasuke Wayman is, it's not even the only example of seemingly impossible ancient technology in Peru. Let's take a look at the Inca Misana Temple of Olantetambo. The Inca came here to worship their water gods, and they couldn't possibly have built them a more fitting tribute. Any civil engineer of the modern era would be impressed by what they achieved with this building. The temple is 9,000 feet above sea level, yet water flows through it in abundance thanks to the artificial canal system that feeds it. The canal system stretches on for miles through solid rock, all the way to the basins of the Patacancha Valley. It's thought that building the temple took the Inca most of the 13th century. They included waterfalls and pools and displayed knowledge of the concept of hydraulic jumps, working around them in places and taking advantage of them in others. They even added a special coating to the rocks to ensure they remained watertight, preventing leakage and loss. To avoid the risk of erosion or issues caused by landslides, they added drainage channels. The level of sophistication is outstanding, and yet the temple is 800 years old. The Lycurgus Cup is an ancient Roman artifact that perfectly demonstrates the capabilities of nanotechnology. That's a field of science we're still just beginning to explore today. But here's the work of an ancient Roman craftsman who knew at least something about it 1,600 years ago. The cup changes color depending on which angle you look at it from. From one direction it's red, but walk around it and you'll see it turn green. That stunning optical illusion is all down to microscopically small particles of silver and gold that were added to the glass mixture. Each particle is a mere 50 nanometers in diameter, invisible to the naked eye. To give you an idea of scale, the particles are 1,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. There's no way the gold and silver got into the mix accidentally, so whoever made the Lycurgus cup knew what they were doing and we have no idea how. It looks like they kept their secrets close to their chest though, because nothing like this artifact has ever been found in any former Roman territory. It's an utterly unique item. 40,000 years ago, an early species of humans lived in and around a cave network in Siberia. They're known as the Denisovans and are named after the caves. From the artifacts they left behind, it seems they were considerably more advanced than any other humans who were around during their era. Take a look at these stone bracelets, for example. 
Not only are they stunning pieces of jewelry, but they show evidence of drilling. No other process could have created the perfectly formed holes that repeatedly appear in the artifacts. That's a problem for historians because based on everything we think we know, there's no way that drills should have been around 40,000 years ago. To make matters worse, the rotation speed of the drill must have been very high, with almost no fluctuation. That necessitates applied drilling, the sort of thing we'd associate with a modern electric drill. This stunning green bracelet is made of chlorite, a material that doesn't occur naturally in the surrounding area. In fact, the nearest natural source is over 120 miles away. Everything about this artifact seems designed to be a slap in the face to historians. We've known for a long time that the history of hydraulic engineering in China goes back thousands of years, but we recently discovered that it's even older than we've always imagined. That's because a remarkably elaborate and advanced dam system has been found in Liangshu within the country's Xijiang province. According to the archaeologists responsible for the discovery, it's 5,100 years old. That makes it the earliest example of the practice in the whole country. There are 10 dams in the area, each built to a different length. The longest of them runs on for more than four miles. There are high dams, low dams, and levees in the system. The level of applied knowledge on show here is amazing, and yet perhaps not as amazing as the fact that the ancient residents of Liangzhu appear to have completed construction work on the dams within 10 years. That's far faster than the Peruvians completed Olente Tambo. To build something like this today, we'd need excavators, trucks, and every piece of advanced digging technology we could lay our hands on. The Liangzhu did it, all with little more than their bare hands and basic tools. When you want to know what time it is, you probably look at either your watch or the screen of your phone. Before they were invented, you'd have looked at a clock on a wall. Prior to that, you'd be telling the time using a sundial. The use of sundials goes back thousands of years, as we can see from this time example that was recently discovered in the ancient Turkish city of Laodicea. It's a stunning marble artifact, shaped like a half circle and facing south. On its surface, we see inscriptions that name the seasons, months, days, and hours in ancient Greek. There should also be a shadow casting needle to allow us to tell the time, but sadly that's no longer attached. If it were, we'd still be able to use it to tell the time today. The artifact is around 2,000 years old and is one of the best preserved and most impressive of its kind. The Egyptians used shadow clocks around 3,500 years ago, but this 2,000-year-old sundial appears to represent a leap forward in time-telling technology. Since we're talking about ancient ways of telling the time, it would be wrong of us not to mention the astrolabe. It's not without reason that some people refer to these ancient gadgets as the 13th century equivalent to the iPhone. They were seen as the height of technological advancement during their era, and everybody wanted one. This portable instrument might not allow you to send memes to your friends, but it does contain a surprising number of moving parts tracking the positions of the sun, moon, and prominent stars in the sky as well as the time of day. In the most sophisticated examples, astrolabes also have charts engraved on their backs that explain how to adjust the dials to determine the correct time of day for the latitude they're in. For 13th century Muslims, an astrolabe was a necessity because it determined the position of the Qibla, thus enabling them to work out which direction to pray in no matter where they were in the world. It's often said that the first astrolabe was invented as long ago as 2,400 years ago by Theon of Alexandria, but the design was heavily refined by the Muslim scholars of the 10th century too. Perhaps the best way to measure the effectiveness of a piece of technology is by how long it continues working for. If we do that, we might say that the Nashtafan windmills of Iran represent the most effective technology in the world. They're still used to grind flour today and have been doing so for more than 1,000 years. They're the oldest working windmills on the planet, 
but they might not look much like the typical image of a windmill you might have in your head. Rather than having spinning sails, the Nashtafan windmills use vertical wooden slats. The slats are coated with straw and clay and are set into hand-carved niches in a 70-foot tall wall. They might not work anywhere else in the world, but Nashtafan is a special place. The name translates into English as Sting of the Storm, which is a reference to the very strong winds that frequently blight the area. They're not much fun to walk in, but they're perfect for powering a windmill. The wind slowly turns the wooden slats, the slats turn the thousand-year-old grindstones, and the mill goes about its business. The responsibility for keeping the mills working is handled by a single custodian, a title that's often passed down from father to son. People generally have one of two reactions when they see pictures of the giant Norayas of Hama. Some people find themselves reminded of Ferris wheels at a fairground, while others think they look like water wheels. Those who believe the latter are closer to the truth. Even in saying that, though, they're so far ahead of their time that they could almost be considered out-of-place artifacts. Water mills didn't become common sites until the early 16th century and were considered cutting-edge technology at the time. The giant Norayas of Hama were built closer to 2,500 years ago. They're so old that the technology behind them was reinvented because everyone had forgotten it. There are 17 of the wheels in total. There used to be more, but sadly, this part of Syria has been badly damaged by war in recent years. Some people believe they're even older than 2,500. We take the estimate of their age from the fact that they're represented on a mosaic in the nearby city of Apamea, dated to the year 469 BCE. There's nothing to say that they weren't already old by the time that mosaic was made. Where did the original idea come from? And why did it take over a thousand years for anybody else to replicate it? We're taking another look at ancient waterways now, but this time it's ancient waterways inside an ancient underground city. This is Kariz Akish in Iran an island that's often better known simply as Kish. It's well known around the world for its luxury hotels and restaurants, but it should arguably be better known for the amazing architectural achievements of its ancient residents. Long before the Romans came up with aqueducts, the people of Iran had invented the Quanat, a sort of vertical well system built along a slope as a way of artificially channeling water. The best example of this old feat of engineering is right here underneath Kish. Kish's Quanat is around 2,500 years old and carries water all the way from the region's mountains to the dry valleys, navigating dense layers of coral in the process. In truth, this entire city is little more than one giant Quanat. The fact that it looks so much like a network of streets and houses is down to a combination of the ancient workers building access points and modern workers dressing the tunnels up to make them more attractive to tourists. While it might be possible to argue about whether water engineering was more sophisticated 2,500 years ago and more advanced than it is today, no such argument can be had about gilding. Our ancient ancestors were far better at gilding than we are, and that's a fact. Even criminals were more skilled at it than our best modern-day experts. Evidence of this can be seen in literally thousands of gold-gilded items discovered in Egypt, Turkey, Israel, Iran, and across Europe. If we wanted to go about the task of gilding today, we'd use electroplating technology. That wasn't an option until the 19th century. For tens of centuries prior to that, our ancestors used a thin layer of mercury as a binding agent, resulting in a better, cleaner finish. We'd never use such a method today because working with mercury is believed to be too dangerous, but people were obviously doing it on an industrial scale 2,000 years ago. Criminals often used gilding as a way of decorating a bronze, wooden, or stone item with a layer of gold and then selling it for a high price on the pretense it was made from solid gold. We suspect a lot of people lost a lot of money that way. 
the ancient Romans loved olive oil. According to the records of the personal physician of Emperor Julian, olive oil was a sound base from which to make ointments for the soothing of wounds and also to pour into antiseptic plasters for healing. Roman soldiers used to drink olive oil before heading into battle. Some historical records even suggest they bathed and washed their hair with it. To cut a long story short, the Romans used a lot of olive oil. That means they needed an efficient and reliable way of crushing olives. Fortunately, they did. Their olive crushing device of choice was known as a trapetum. The best preserved example of such a device comes from the famous archaeological site of Pompeii. Olives would be poured into this bowl and then crushed by the two concave stones attached to the beam, which was, in turn, connected to an iron pivot. The whole contraption could then be fitted onto a central post to allow the stones to turn inside it. If you lined a few of these up in a row, you could make vast quantities of olive oil every day, which is just as well, considering the high demand for it. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.